If you have your Bible this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 24. Now last week I preached the message when Jesus comes and it had to do with when Jesus comes back, we've already been raptured, had the judgment seat of Christ, uh, the marriage of the Lamb, which I don't even think I even mentioned that part of it. And then uh, we come back at His coming, we got a, a thousand years of peace. But I'm going to talk about this morning, not what's going on in heaven when we're there, but what's happening down here. The, the title of the message is, When the Church is Gone, What Then? When the Church is Gone, What Then? And Matthew chapter 24, verse 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as, not, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. That's that word of prayer. Father, bless the message now. I pray that you just uh, speak through me, Lord. Uh, I don't think there's anyone in here that doesn't understand how this thing lays out uh, uh, from the rapture on and what happens here on earth. Uh, Father, I pray just help remind us, Lord, what this world's going to face when the church is gone, uh, what our loved ones and people that we know are going to face uh, when the church is gone. And Father, to help us to have pity and throw out a lifeline to them, Lord, and just pray that you speak through the message and ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> you know, I remember when I got saved back in the 70s, late 70s, 70s and 80s, uh, they used this type of message a lot because, you know, it was kind of like, I don't know, a mini revival in the midst of Laodicea. I, it just seemed like a lot of people got saved back in the 70s and 80s, and um, there, there seemed to be Bible-believing churches that were popping up here and there, you know. And, but a lot of churches, even a lot of Pentecostal or Charismatic churches, would, would talk about the tribulation, talk about the time when the beast is here, and uh, and all that, and they use that, and I, I don't know why we're not still using it, because it's coming. Um, when I read, when I read about what's coming, it just blows my mind. I can't even imagine myself being stuck here. It's horrifying to me. You know, there's some things, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that happen to you right now, but man, the list of things that's going to happen on this earth is absolutely terrifying. And I think about people I know that are going to be here, and I think, wow, I, I, I don't want them to be here. Not for that. Uh, they need to be saved. And uh, listen, we're going out. If we were staying for this, I, they're probably not one of us would make it as far as if you had to keep the faith. And it's going to be horrible. It said that even the elect would be deceived. Now, God has to shorten the days of it, or the elect would be deceived. But anyway, here's some things that when the church is gone, what then? Well, the first thing is that salvation won't be so simple. Because it is simple now. I tell everybody at the rest home and at the prison, I said, I got saved when I was 16. You don't get any dumber in life than when you're 16. You know what I mean? I mean, that's when you're at your dumbest. You think when you come out of the womb, that may be your dumbest moment? No. When you hit 16, that's when you get really dumb. And you know, God was able to save me. I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ at 16. I think that's a, that's a miracle in itself. But I did. Uh, but it won't be that simple in the tribulation. What's coming? The church age, the gospel, the grace of God will, be, will have ended. Now I know that to some Baptists this is you know, heresy what I'm about to preach and teach. But, the, but it's the truth of Scripture. They just don't know how to rightly divide. They're either they can't read or they're ignorant. Because the Bible says it's not going to be that simple. There's a couple things involved there. Acts 20, 24, Paul said, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in, in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And that's what we're doing. We testify the gospel of the grace of God. That for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is simple, straightforward. You either receive Him or you reject Him. Well, in the tribulation, that's not going to be that simple. There are some other things involved there. One of them is endurance. Do you know that? You're going to have to endure some things. He says over there in Matthew 24, 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. 
Well, I'm not enduring anything. Yeah, man. We're told to enjoy. I'm not enduring anything. You enduring anything? So, well, I'm enduring my wife, or I'm enduring my husband, and I'm enduring my children. Okay, but you're not enduring to salvation. And you know what? These folks that are enduring, they're waiting on it. It's not like they got it. He that endureth unto the end shall be saved. You ever think about that? They don't have it till the end. Because it's talking about all Israel shall be saved. When they see the Lord Jesus Christ coming, that's their salvation on its way. That's not my salvation experience. I got saved when I was 16 years old in the basement of my parents' house. And there's where I got eternal life. But in the tribulation, you're going to have to endure some things. Not only that, but it says you're going to have patience. Well, that'll have left me out right there. I mean, who's got patience these days? We wait, hurry up and get this, and you know. Revelation 14, 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Keep the commandments of God? Are you doing that? Did you obey the Sabbath yesterday? How about the new moons and the feast? You don't even know when they are. <laughs> or most of them. But you've got to have patience. Why? You're waiting for something. You're enduring something. And then there has to be sacrifice. What? That's what it says. In Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 and 11, He said, I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb. And by, I mean, that sounds good, by the blood of the Lamb. I believe in that. It was by the blood of Christ. And by the word of their testimony. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Hmm. I've got to think about that one a second. Is that how you go get saved? Love not your life unto the death? What death is that? <laughs> Old age? <laughs> Heart attack? Cancer? No, he's talking about beheading. They loved not their life unto the death, and so they were beheaded. That's the mode of execution in the tribulation. That's not us. We don't believe that. Because that's not for this time frame. But don't you know that tribulation salvation is a little tricky? The body of Christ is not here, so how can you get in it? It's gone. That's because it is different. It's different just like it is in the Old Testament. It's different. What we have now, you cannot, you cannot beat it with a stick. Man, it, there's nothing better, there's no better deal that God ever laid out for mortal man than what He's given us. Boy, I'm so glad He did. I'd hate to find myself in the tribulation without salvation. I couldn't even, I, I don't think I'd make it. In fact, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't. Because <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what, you're going to have to endure some things. Um, if you take the mark of the beast, you're done. Finny. Revelation 14, verse 9 to 11. And the third angel uh, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Notice two different places you can get it. I, you know, we go to the prisons all the time. We see them with these tattoos. I mean, this is the, listen, this generation will have no problem taking the mark of the beast right on their forehead. Uh, there's times when we see guys come in there, man, and their face is tattooed. Okay? Um, I'll tell you, you've got to be hardcore into something to do that, to, to tattoo your face. Okay? But there's going to be a lot of... This generation has no problem. In fact, the entire generation has no problem with tattoos, even your grandma. Because old grandma's down there at the tattoo parlor getting, getting one. I mean, she, pay, she may put it on her wrist, but she'll still get it. I remember growing up, man, if you, if you wore a tattoo, you were some kind of lower human being. I'm serious. That's just the way it was. Yeah. I mean, you, knew, you were, uh, I mean, well, now everybody gets them. And say, why? It's the spirit of this age because they're going to be getting it here or here. They're just getting them ready for it. You do see that, right? Uh, it says in verse uh, 10, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, 
that's without mercy, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. I mean, you're done for if you take that mark. And listen, the pressure on you will be incredible. You'll have an entire world pressuring you to take it. You won't be able to buy or sell. I don't know if you think you know what that means, but that's called not being able to go to the grocery store and get anything to eat. And then probably a good portion of the population that wouldn't help you even if they could. So you instantly become poor, you instantly become homeless, and you become hunted because you're against this kingdom. It'll be a great pressure on you to take the mark of the beast. Not only that, but you have Satan will rule on this earth as the son of perdition. I, it's one thing, man. It's one thing to have a bad system. It's another thing when the devil himself is down here. <laughs> and he's running the show in the flesh. You know what the mystery of godliness is, right? The mystery of godliness is God manifest in the flesh. The mystery of iniquity is exactly the opposite. It's Satan manifest in the flesh. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. We know there's a spiritual thing going on right now. But you know what happens to that mystery of iniquity? He becomes flesh. He comes down here. And he'll be running this show. Now, how would you like to leave your, your aunts and, your, and your, uh, your uncles and your cousins? And <laughs> how would you like to leave them with that system? Knowing that the devil's coming. Um, he says over there in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7 to 11, The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, there are some Baptists that believe that that's the Holy Spirit or the church or whatever. It's funny thing, it's not in the context anywhere. Then what's in the context is the mystery of iniquity. And it says it shall be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. You know, uh, there's two things there. There's the man of sin, son of perdition. And this is something I just saw, never picked it up before. I don't know why, because it's right there in front of me. But he talks about that man of sin. There's been many a man of sin. Many. The King James translators knew this because they put it in the, uh, the epistle dedicatory in the front of your Bible. And in it, it talks about that, that man of sin. And there's been many a man of sin. Any pope, the whole... Or, Anyone who holds the office of a pope is the man of sin. It's just whether he becomes the son of perdition or not. Because there is one man of sin that's going to be here or show up or something that's going to become the son of perdition. And he has to be taken out of the way for that thing to happen. If you don't understand that, well, Satan is cast out of heaven. Judas comes out of the bottomless pit. That's... The uh, spirit of perdition comes out of the bottomless pit and goeth into the man of sin. He's got to be dead. Before he can take that thing over completely, that man of sin's got to die. So when that guy's, you'll find a death where he gets the sword across his right eye, his right arm, Zechariah, and then three days later, the false prophet raises him from the dead. But it ain't the same guy. He's went from the man of sin to the son of perdition. Judas is back. And this time, this is Satan manifest. It's the unholy trinity. And he's down here. Imagine the damage he can do if he's here. Um, so you thought you had bad candidates for <laughs> to rule you. It's going to get really bad. Um, not only will Satan rule this earth as the son of perdition, but suffering will exist on an unimaginable scale. And as I read through the book of Revelation, as I read other places in the Bible, what Jesus, uh, when Jesus Christ preached about this, and He said what was coming, He said there's nothing like it, nor ever shall be again. And I know this time is coming. Listen, when the rapture takes place, and I believe the rapture will happen, I believe it will happen soon. Uh, I believe it will happen in our lifetimes. Uh, it may happen... Uh, it may happen in a couple of years. I, I'm not going to date the thing, but I'm telling you that we're running 
we're running toward the edge of running out of time with what the Bible says over there in Matthew chapter 24. That fig tree that came back to life, that was uh, born anew, if you will, that thing started in 1948, and this generation is quickly passing. And I believe it's coming. And I believe that when we leave, everything that the Bible says is going to happen will happen. The Bible's never been wrong about anything else. Why would it be wrong about that? Have you ever looked at some of those things? You ever read about them seals and them trumpets and them vials over there in the book of Revelation? You ever saw that war on a global scale? In one battle, it mentions, there are 200 million, 200 million men that fight in a battle called the Battle of Armageddon. Revelation 9, 16, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand. A thousand thousand is a million. 200,000, thousand is 200 million. And I heard the number of them. Can you imagine that, that size of that army? Can you imagine them all dead? Where it says the, horse, the blood is up to the horse's bridle. 200 million. What's the population? We're 350 in, in America. That's almost two-thirds of this country dead. Two-thirds. 200 million men. That's war, on, and, and that's just one battle. There are, other, there are other things going on. There are other, I mean, there's fighting going on all over the place. There's not only that, but there's star, starvation on a world scale. Not just third world, but on a world scale. You can see that. You can see that pretty clearly when you realize that, of course, Moses and Elijah are coming back, and there'll be a three and a half year drought worldwide. We've gone through about six weeks without any rain here. Man, this place is parched earth. Can you imagine three and a half years without a drop of rain anywhere on the planet? Except for a few spaces where God wants to preserve somebody like Selah or Petra. Can you imagine three and a half years of it? How dry it is out there just right now, going about, about six weeks, seven weeks without rain. And we had a soaking spring. I mean, it is wet all the time. I apologize for praying for no rain now. I apologize for that. That was me. <laughs> I'm so tired of this rain. Now I'm like, please, Lord, let it rain. Uh, I think it might have been me and some others. I'm not going to take all the blame. But three and a half years of that, can you imagine can you imagine what it'll do to the food provisions all over this world? You know what most people have in their house? If they're, if, if they're fortunate, they have three days worth of food in their house. Three days. FEMA tells you to have seven. And I think they keep up in it. Okay? Um, I wouldn't be without three weeks. Food and water. Minimum three weeks. Uh, you can have something go wrong, man, and have civil unrest, and you might have to hunker down for three weeks. Instead of you being the fool out there that's going to get the last gallon of milk at Walmart, you'll be, I'm going to get it, honey. Yeah, you're going to get killed is what you're going to get. The Bible says that a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the fool, <laughs> he just rushes right in there for that gallon of milk. He's going to get that last gallon of milk, and there are about a thousand of them behind him wanting that same last gallon of milk. You gotta know, you gotta know when to stay low. You gotta know when to hunker down. Let the evil pass. Let the heathen do what they're gonna do. <laughs> and then emerge. <laughs> but you gotta know when to stay down. And um, you know, I used to I'm I consider myself a prepper. I'm not prepping for the tribulation, but I consider myself in preparing. I believe in being prepared. I think Jesus believed in being prepared. One of the last messages he ever preached to his disciples, or the last, uh, one of the last things he told them, he says, uh, you remember when I told you you didn't need any shoes, and you didn't need a coat, and you didn't need, uh, um, what's the thing they carry, a script? I said, you remember when I told you that? He goes, well, I've changed my mind. Not changed my mind, he says, I'm leaving, and now you're going to need your purse with you. That's called money on hand. Okay, I can go into a lot about that, but money on hand. Your Script, your script, if you go back here and look at the Old Testament, it's a shepherd's bag. You know what we call that today, don't you? We call that a bug-out bag or an overnight bag. 
Nice to have one of them ready in case you need it. So you have some, you have your purse with you and your script, and then what did he tell you to do? Buy your sword. And before now, nobody could touch them disciples without the Lord. The Lord protected them. When they came to get him in the garden, what happens? They fall backwards. He protected them. He said, but when I'm gone, he goes, even if you have to sell a garment, you buy a sword. You may have to protect yourself. Uh, I, you know, I believe the Second Amendment, but I had that long before the Second Amendment was ever penned. The right to protect my family. So, I mean, if that's that way now, can you imagine in the tribulation how things will be? Oh, I'm sure that there'll be gun confiscation. Anytime you want to genocide somebody, you've got to confiscate their guns first. Right? There's some diabolical persecutions in the tribulation. Diabolical. Beheading comes back, if you can believe that. Now, I don't know if you know when beheading actually went out. Okay? It happened in France. France is the one that did the beheading, you know. And the guy that did this, I mean, it drew big crowds, you know. And uh, the guillotine would fall and cut off the head, and the guy would take the head and raise it up. And I believe at the time, the last one performed, they were beheading a woman. And the thing fell, and he grabbed her head, and he lifted it up, and he smacked her. And she looked back and grimaced. She turned her eyes back and grimaced. It's, that's it. We're done with this. I think that's the last one they had. Okay? So when somebody tells you it's instant death, I don't know about that now. Now that's what I read. Car, you know, it maybe you might want to fact check that one. But that's what I read. That they, they, he smacked her and she turned around and grimaced and, and, just, and the crowd just about went nuts. So anyway. Um, but that, can you imagine that, that form of death coming back? Can you see yourself... I mean, if you were in the tribulation, could you see yourself putting your neck down to have it decapitated? The thing is, you're probably watching half a dozen people going before you. Can you see your family doing that? I can see a lot of people taking the mark of the beast to keep from that happening. Uh, you'll find over there in the book of Revelation where it talks about the souls of them under the altar there. There's a lot of them sacrificed on an altar, beheaded. And there's even cannibalism mentioned, drinking of blood. Of course, they might have to do that, you know, there's nothing to drink. But there's cannibalism involved there. This, th listen, this whole world will come unglued. It's going to come unglued. There's an earthquake mentioned over there in Revelation chapter 16. It says that there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So this is not some small thing. So mighty an earthquake and so great and the great city was divided into three parts and the, here's what it says, and the cities of the nations fell. What does that mean? That means Tokyo fell, New York fell, Chicago fell, Sydney fell, and any other Large city, you can think, of, this earthquake shook all the cities, the major cities of this world, and they just tumbled. I can't even imagine that. I can't imagine the death toll from that. It says, And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. There are hailstones mentioned. Okay, I've seen some pretty big ones. I remember back in, uh, I was 14 years old, that'd be 1974. And uh, I remember the sky was lime green. Because I remember, it was a, what a pretty color. <laughs> what followed <laughs> was hailstones about the size of baseballs. This is when the, the Xenia tornado hit. And where I lived in Miamisburg, we had hailstones that were about the size of baseballs. And I remember that, you know, after we ran inside and keep from getting killed, uh, we noticed that it just, we had, my dad had this little pop-up camp, camper. And it just popped, it just put holes, big old baseball size holes all over that camper. And man, it dented cars. Oh, it was terrible. These things were, I mean, and I thought, man, if one of them were to hit you, it'd brain you. Now listen, it says in Revelation 16, 21, And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. Okay? It says, And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. When you try to find out how much a talent weighs, 
you're going to get from 70 pounds to 125 pounds. Now, I've always thought it was 16 pounds, and I started doing some other study. No, no. It's from 70 pounds to 125 pounds. Can you imagine a nice ball coming out of heaven and hitting your house when even seven, let's just, let's just put it on the, the light side of 70 pounds. Why, man, it, it, you, know, you couldn't get protection in your basement. It'd go right through your basement. And we were talking, and it says mingle with fire. And I'm thinking, you know, either some, there's some chemical composition there that allows that thing to just burst into flames. Maybe the friction, like, like a meteorite. Think about that. But it's so frozen, yet it's so, you know, it's like, it's like frying ice cream. I don't know. I guess there's a way. <laughs> Mexican. Or, or I was thinking, okay, if it, if it didn't come as like a meteorite, you know, where it's on fire when it comes. I mean, I can't imagine something on fire. like. But you're talking, man, water is H2O. And both hydrogen and oxygen are flammable. So I don't know what's going on there. But imagine, if one thing about ice and snow I watched this uh, film one time where, where they were trying to teach us, uh, I don't know why they, they showed us this film, but it was about uh, blasting in, uh, in, in um, snow. You never blast, you never blow up anything. It's, I don't know why they were showing us that, you know. I was, it had nothing to do with blasting anything, although it was interesting. And they showed this film where this guy, he's, he's, he's walking through the snow, and uh, he's checking this connection. They were going to... Uh, they were going to blow up this stuff. They were practicing, I don't know, something or other. And when he leaned down to touch it, it just shows, boom, and just everything's gone. And at the end of the thing, I went up to the guy and I said, was that real or was that stage? He says, we don't tell people. And he looked at him and goes, real. Because there's such a, you build up a static electricity in snow. That's why you don't touch something that can blow up. Well, I'm thinking, man, here comes this ice ball. You know, when you're flying through air, you, you pick up static. I just don't know. I'm thinking when it hits something, man, who knows? It might, it'd be like a fireball going off when it hit. I don't know. I don't know. But that's just interesting to me. But you imagine something 70 pounds or 125 pounds coming at you. It says that one third of the waters turned to blood, and another third are turned bitter. Revelation chapter 8. I hardly any drinking water, uh, and what and listen, what that didn't destroy. Imagine that the three and a half year drought did. I mean, you talk about drilling for water. I've got a deep well at my house. It was hand dug, and I've got a thing over it with a big lock on there. I use the water during the winter time. I lower a bucket and I give it to my goats because it doesn't freeze up. I never have to worry about it freezing. I looked down there the other day. I'm just curious. I opened it locked it because I don't use it during the summertime. I've got regular water. And I looked, looked down in that well, and it was 15 to 20 feet down. I've never seen it that low. Now, that well's 40 feet deep, so I've got plenty of water. But we're only talking six, seven, eight weeks. And it's already down 15 to 20 feet. What do you think? Year? Wouldn't last that long, would it? You imagine at the end of three and a half years? Talk about some desperate people. Yeah, oh, we're not done yet. Not only does he turn the water to blood or turns it bitter, uh, these nightmarish creatures show up, torment men for five months. This is like every, every horror film, every uh, worst case scenario you could ever think of happening all at once. If it's not bad enough, you know, that the whole environment, I mean, you know, the, the environment's turned on them, which is what they, you know, they, they think it's coming anyway, so here it comes. But it's the Lord doing it. But everything turning on them, but now you've got, you've got some sci-fi critter coming out, of the, coming out of the earth, and they're coming out of hell because it's a furnace that they're coming out of, and the black smoke's coming out of there, which is going to pollute the air. But here come these, these things... And they're able to torment me, and they can't even die from it. They just sting you, and you just, ah, you just in utter pain. They're not even there to kill. They're just there to torment. And these things are going to be all over the planet. And then there's a disease of leprosy. 
He says there, the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them that worshipped his image. You have, I think it's two chapters, maybe three, I think it's two chapters in your Bible about leprosy. Two whole chapters. Because that's going to be the pox. That's going to be the sore. That's going to be the thing that all that take the mark of the beast are going to get infected with. So you got that going around. We're not done yet. The sun gets so hot it scorches men. Now you're out of water. What's, ter- what's available is turned bitter or to blood. The rest of it's dried up. So what happens? The sun starts heating up. Now, I don't know if it gets seven times brighter. There's something, some mention of that in the Bible. I, I also has a reference to the millennium. I don't know. All I know is it says that in Revelation 16 that that sun starts scorching men. Scorching them. Maybe it's just the radiation off of it. Maybe, um, you know, we keep talking about this, uh, this protective thing around uh, the earth. What's it called? The ozone. That we're depleting the ozone. Well, I think the Lord just went ahead and he just deleted it instead of depleting it. <laughs> and maybe they're just being burned from cosmic radiation or from uh, uh, lunar or solar radiation. But then it's followed by darkness. It's one thing the sun's scorching you, but then all of a sudden you're, 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 they find themselves in total darkness. Some of these line up with what Moses did in Egypt. So dark you can feel it. So dark you can't move. I give the illustration of being in a mammoth cave down in, in Kentucky and we got pretty well about halfway through, you know, and they were taking a break, eating lunch, and they wanted us to know what perfect darkness looked like. So they turned out the lights and everybody turned out their flashlights and man... It was a darkness you could feel. It was, and I can tell you what I did. I did nothing. You can't do anything. You can't take a step. You can't, you can't do anything. You just stay still. It's like, you know, the Bible talks about chains of darkness. It works. You put somebody in a completely dark, they can't move. Or if they do, they could hurt themselves. But you just didn't dare, man. You could fall right off. You could hit your head on a rock. I mean, anything could happen in those caves. So you didn't dare try to move it. You couldn't get out. It was impossible. We were a couple miles in that cave. Perfect darkness. Can you imagine darkness so thick you can't move? And you're gnaw- it says they gnaw their tongue for pain. And then it's followed by more wars. And I just, I didn't cover it all. And you know, that's not even when the fireworks begin. The the real fireworks begin when the Lord comes back. In flaming fire, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I read that, man, you know, I think of some of my worst enemies and I couldn't wish that on them. I couldn't. I'll end it with this. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. A man and wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise and turns her head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears and one's left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. Life was filled with guns and war. And everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. How could you have been so blind? The father spoke, the demons dined. The son has come and you've been left behind. 
The father spoke, the demons dine, the son has come, and you've been left behind. The son has come, and you've been left. Let's all stand. Got anybody you care about? Time is a marching forward, and these days are coming.